And welcome to the conversation. My name is Carrie Ann, and I will be your host in this first segment of the show. With me today, I have a Jared, who is our resident astronomer. Mm -hmm. I also have a Benjamin. I'm back. Our founder. Whoa. How's that? Wow, I feel uh, like I got an upgrade. What? You didn't, though. I also have a Donna, <laughs> oh, goodness, behind us, who is going to be producing the show, you know, the important one. Now, today yes. in news, we have. Oh, my gosh, it's wet. It's too wet. I have got an insane number of launches. So many launches. I'm also going to be talking about Blue Origin pulling a little bit of a switcheroo on their uh, second stage. No, right? And then, I know you've been asking, we have a round table discussion this week all about how humanity is not exactly living amongst the stars. What's holding us back? And then in our third segment, of course, we all come back again together to talk about your questions and comments about last week's show. But this is tomorrow, Orbit 11.13. Good morning. How's everything up in the sky? Now, for sure, I want to make sure I give a huge thank you to our citizens of tomorrow. These are the Escape Velocity citizens. They get their name in their show of all three segments. They get access to exclusive citizen-only hangouts that we also had this last week. And they get so much more. If you are interested in getting your name in the show and a lot of other fun things, please feel free to head on over to patreon.com slash tmro or makersupport.com slash tmro. So we have to get going because there are a lot of launches. Mm -hmm. Um, there, there's so Beth said so, so many, many launches. So many launches. I'll, um, I'll see you guys later. It's, yeah, <laughs> no kidding. It's it's another one of those things that uh, citizens at a particular level also get access to. Is he's uh, out? He's out. He's leaving. He's literally leaving. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, you get access uh, to our uh, a read only version of our rundown, which means you can see just how many launches there are. So, um, Ben, in lieu of a space mic being here, I'm going to hand them over to you because Jared has important things to talk about this yeah. week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'll be replacing the hologram who is out for repairs this week. Uh, hope to have him back by next week. I think uh, it was something it lost some in, annual maintenance. literally lost in transit. <laughs> All right, so let's start with Thursday, March 29th at 1126 Coordinated Universal Time. This is a GLSV Mark II. Five, four, three, Two, one, zero, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus L40 four, ignition plus uh, nominal, S139 ignited, off, and vehicle lifts off from the launch pad. And you know, the GLSV, that's the Geosynchronous Satellite Launch Vehicle. It is a three-stage rocket with a solid fuel core center stage. It's got four liquid, uh, liquid solids, liquid boosters around the outside, and a liquid second stage with an improved engine. Uh, it's a high-thrust Vicus engine and a cryogenic third stage. So they're doing some testing on that uh, improved uh, uh, engine on they're that. They're just throwing all of the new things at it at once. It's like, if something goes yeah. wrong, is that... I mean, I feel like that should be an issue of, well, like, I mean, they, they, which I mean, new thing did we screw up, guys? Well, yeah, well, it's the engines. No, it's the engines that were new okay. on this one. Essentially, okay. they're testing the upgraded engines. Uh, they also have the GSAT-6A spacecraft that has a deploy to deployable S-band antenna with multiple communication beams. I believe they're beam-forming arrays. Mm. Uh, they also tested some new technologies to enhance in India's communication network. So they had oh, the test really cool. engine itself and then also kind of a test satellite on that vehicle. Let's move along to uh, China. They had a Long March 3B. That also happened on Thursday, March 29th at 1756 Coordinating Universal Time. There she goes. Love that orange smoke. Yeah, well, uh, I'll talk to that in a moment. Uh, this this uh, vehicle launched two Bidu navigation satellites. These uh, satellites are the seventh and eighth members of China's third generation Bidu fleet, uh, or Baidu. Anyone know the proper pronunciation? I, don't know. I uh, like so Bidu. It, yeah, I like Bidu. Bidu, Bidu. You? Uh, Bidu? 
All right, yeah, cool. cool. Um, it's named for the Chinese word for the Big Dipper constellation. The first Bidu test uh, satellite launched in 2000, and they have since launched 31 navigation payloads into orbit. But again, this was their third generation, uh, which is why there were, that was only seven in eight of those. Uh, the third generation vehicles up, uh, carry upgraded atomic clocks, which helps the accuracy of the GPS uh, constellation itself. So the more accurate the time on the GPS satellite, the more accurate. He's really going to stay out for all of launches, isn't he? The more accurate your uh, navigation can Jared actually be. Jared needed to go for a walk. He was really <laughs> upset by that. So the Long March 3C rocket, he mentioned that orange smoke. That's yeah. because the first stage, uh, it has four liquid-powered boosters, but they're hydrazine and nitro uh, nitrogen peroxide. Tetroxide? Tetroxide. There we go. Uh, that is a hypergolic fuel, so don't breathe, breathe in those orange. Are hypergols always orange like Smells that? Smells like fish. Uh, I don't think hypergols have to always be orange. Hypergols can be many different things, but in this particular case, yes, they are orange. And so that and way you can look at it and go, hypergol. Um, not always. Okay. Not always, no. That is not a fair thing to always do. But uh, if you don't generally see any sort of anything, that might be like a hydrolox engine, like a hi um, hydrogen liquid oxygen. What yeah. are you doing? Yeah, so it, it, <laughs> So, you, well, um, yeah, oh, that's a good point. In, in general, if you see orange stuff come off of a rocket, run the other way. Right. Don't, don't run towards it, run away from it. Right. All right, uh, moving right along, we had a Soyuz 2-1V launch. I like this footage. Oh, wait, do we not have, I thought we yeah. had, oh, no, we have we rollout don't. footage. Yeah. Oh, so I get I get some. So, all right. So Thursday, March 29th. See a trend there. Yeah. Thursday, March 29th, 2018, at 1738 it's coordinated day, universal time. Like I said, this was a Soyuz 2-1V. It's the fourth flight of this rocket. It launched from the uh, Plesk Cosmodrome in Russia, and it carried the Cosmos 25. 25 payload up top. Uh, that payload is a, a small experimental satellite uh, flying for Roscosmos. Uh, because it is classified, we don't actually have a whole lot of information about it, but here you go. Here's the lift off itself. So I, I joke a lot that uh, we don't use a lot of GoPros uh, in aerospace, but I'm pretty sure that's a GoPro. <laughs> uh, uh, anyhow, uh, yeah, not, not a whole lot of information on the payload itself, other than it is EMKA, or Experimental Small Spacecraft. Uh, and again, Cosmos 2525, which is a sequential designation under the system that was actually designed back in the Soviet Union era of all oh, places. Yeah. yeah, they just keep incrementing the number one by one by one hey, for well. all of the things that they don't want to actually give you a proper name. All right, uh, so this next launch. I Do, like this oh, one. He's no. back. <laughs> but because of the, I like the snow. I think it's pretty. Yeah, it is, it is quite. Actually, uh, there is some old footage of a Soyuz launch launching in basically a blizzard. Um, if you search YouTube, you can find it. I, I think that is some of the most incredible launch footage out on the internet of just this rocket launching, you know, right through a blizzard and, and Russia being like, cool, it'll be fine. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, You're this, feeling so. better? Yeah, it was good. Okay. Nice walk. It's nice out today. Good. So. Yeah, and it's a beautiful yeah. day. So, Jared, I'll have to hand California. this one over to you. Absolutely. Uh, this is a uh, SpaceX launch, so I can't cover it due to uh, my affiliation with SpaceX. Yeah, so. so I'll cover it because I'm not affiliated. So, yesterday, it was on March 30th at 1413 coordinated universal time from Space Launch Complex 4 East at Vandenberg Air Force Base in Southern California. The sixth Falcon 9 launch of 2018 occurred. And let's roll that beautiful launch footage. Five, four. Ah, oh, that three, is colored beautifully. Two, one. And it carried 10 Iridium Next satellites in orbit. This is the fifth launch of that particular contract with Iridium. All of the satellites separated successfully, and it flew on a booster that previously was used for the Iridium 3 mission back in October of 2017. This was flown exactly one year since SpaceX reused an orbital class first stage. Now, 
attempting ferrying recovery. That was unfortunately unsuccessful. Mr. Stephen was out in the Pacific Ocean, Mr. Stephen being the boat that attempts to catch the fairings. But, uh, Elon Musk tweeted that the fairings GPS guided parafoil twisted during descent, causing the fairing to hit the ocean at high speed. They're going to be doing drop tests from a helicopter that could occur in the next few weeks to help solve that issue. Now, uh, interesting to note, the webcast ended around nine minutes in the flight just after main engine cutoff of the second stage. This was caused by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, putting in a restriction to transmission of imagery from space. It's unknown if this will be resolved before the next Falcon 9 launch, which, the web, which is currently slated for April 2nd of 2018. So just a few days away, which will be CRS-14 sending a Dragon to the space station with a nice load of science on board. But wonderful shots. <laughs> Some great comments always. from the chat room. Is that, like a, is that like a universal unit of measurement, a load? A load? A yes. Load of science? <laughs> well, there's some other <laughs> words I can put in front of the load. Gotcha. Um, like a, a metric, you know what ton. A metric uh, ton. Yeah. There's things like that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and it's really interesting um, with that. And uh, as many of you are uh, <laughs> noting in the chat room, um, <laughs> yeah. certain things can't be spoken about. <laughs> I like that um, one that I can't talk about. No, no uh, right? And then uh, yeah. I like uh, this one. Uh, uh, let's see here. Noah, thanks. Noah, that's pretty thanks. good. That one. Was good. Uh, no uh, opinion. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, I didn't mean to hit that one. There we go. Yeah. Uh, Noah pulled rank. Uh, yeah. And yeah. also, uh, we can't forget uh, that the CRS 14 launch is currently scheduled for, as Lisa is pointing out, uh, April Toost. April so, Toost. Which uh, making its annual appearance for <sighs> us here. An old school <laughs> tomorrow joke from last year, actually. So I guess it's not that old school. Yeah. It's haunting. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyhow, yeah. I have no opinion on that one. All right, uh, <laughs> that that joke will get old. Already done. Yesterday. Already okay, done. All great. right. Uh, last launch. Last launch. This was China's tenth launch of 2018. This one launched on March uh, 20th. I want to say 30th. I think I typed that wrong. Uh, 2018 <laughs> at three. Yeah, that's not right. Uh, at 3:22 coordinated universal time. Yeah, I don't have a lot. It's China, so I don't have a lot of footage it's like of it. Somebody sitting on a hill. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, this is another one where you don't want to be near this particular rocket. This was. Uh, I mean, that guy does. <laughs> yeah. You know the internet points that dude just got? Oh, man. This is a Long March 4C. Uh, it launched three Gaufen, uh, again, I hope I pronounced that right, but Gaufen satellites. Gaufen stands for high resolution, which is apt because these are civilian high resolution remote sensing satellites. Now we talked about the 3 uh what did we have before a 3C I think it was 3B whatever we had before. Well this is uh <laughs> <laughs> this, yeah, China has a lot of rockets. Uh, this particular rocket on the first stage, it used N204 and UDMH, which is dinitrogen di peroxide and unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine. Jeez, that is a mouthful. Dimethyl hydrazine. Uh, that is a hypergolic fuel as well. Uh, so, you know, don't go near it. Um, and yeah, stage two, also hypergolic. Stage three, also hypergolic. So that is one of those rockets you want to stay away from. Uh, and actually, as I said, this was a, um, a high resolution remote sensing satellite. This is part of China's plan to uh, deploy a whole new constellation of high resolution satellites uh, by the, and have it fully operational by the year 2020. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. So there's a lot of stuff there. So, a lot of stuff. Yeah. A lot of launches. A lot of things. Holy oh, cats. Yeah. So many launches. What an awesome problem good. for us to have, right? Remember yeah. Space Vidcast back in the day? We'd do yeah. like a launch a month maybe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, not anymore. Now it's, what was that, five launches in yeah. one week? Yeah. 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 And more to come. More yeah. coming up. Like, you'll yeah. see the launch calendar this oh, week. We're not done. Launch. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, no, right. cool. probably, there's one going right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, all right, good, because... Uh, oh, did I get him? Almost yeah. pug-locked him. And, and you've got the next... Um, Great, so... Great. You're welcome. Carry on. So, onomatopoeia? I feel like we've talked about this Not one before. onomatopoeia. It's, it's so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, mua, that is mua. Oh my mua. gosh! It of does, course it is. Gosh, guys, uh, oh, mua, yeah. mua. So, so you know, type. I've been like really obsessed with the interstellar interloper ever since it came through our solar system last year. It's like it's really interesting because this is the first time we've ever seen anything <laughs> like this. Um, and you know, mua, mua is Hawaiian, and mm -hmm. it's it means scout. Okay. So like scout through the solar system, kind of. Thing. They're making fun of the, they're poking fun at the idea that it's okay. an alien ship because it's not. 
Got they're, it. But they're like, hey, 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 hey. you know, the internet doesn't so. actually have a sarcasm font. Um, <laughs> it yeah. needs one. That's a great idea. Uh, yeah, I think we, we should. need a sarcasm font. Oh wait, we have one. Comic Sans. Oh wow. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> anyway, go. On. Um, so we know that it came from outside of the solar system, yeah. and that it's a sh cigar-shaped asteroid, roughly 400 meters long. That's red in color, and when it zipped past the sun, it was traveling at 315 hundred thousand kilometers an hour. That's really, really fast. Like, right. super fast. Right. So, Oumuamua likely isn't the first interstellar object to go through our solar system. At any given time, there's likely thousands of these objects out there. But it was the first that we were able to detect. And with subsequent further observations with some of the largest ground-based telescopes and most powerful space-based telescopes, the mystery is only deepened further as to its origins. Now, Dr. Alan Jackson of the Center for Planetary Sciences at the University of Toronto Scarborough published a study that may help solve a piece of that puzzle of its origins, but also subsequently asked another piece to the puzzle when we're trying to solve this. Now Jackson and his team created models to test how well different star systems are at throwing objects like asteroids and comets away from it, ejecting them. And it showed that objects like Oumuamua, asteroids, are more likely to be ejected from binary star systems than single star systems. This result, super fascinating because it's a great example of studying something and getting more questions than answers. But it also answers a huge question that up until now we had no real actual solid answer for, which is why was Oumuamua an asteroid? basically something without ice or what we would call volatiles on it. Mm -hmm. Why was it an asteroid? Because, um, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong about this. I really like our hyperbolic friends and whatever flavor they come in. But <laughs> it was predicted that when we were going to find an object like this, specifically an interstellar, object like this. It would much more likely be a cometary object rather than something like an asteroid because comets tend to form further away from their stars than asteroids, which means that when they come into orbits closer to their stars, they're moving much faster, higher velocities, and are much more likely to be ejected entirely from their systems. Hmm. Well, this study basically posits that even with objects like asteroids only making up one-third of all the material ejected from binary star systems, the fact that stellar populations are heavily binary. Most stars out there have a companion mm -hmm. that they're orbiting around. The asteroids and comets, because of that, they're in equal abundance. Oh, so because of the sure. fact that, that most stars are binary mm -hmm. um, and asteroids are being chucked away from these binary stars more frequently than single stars just mm -hmm. around themselves, it kind of evens things out in the distribution of the expected objects, So, Interesting. which was really cool. Yeah. So Great that results. Really, yeah, so, I like that. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, there was a comment in the chat room I wanted to get to. Um, Unbroken Fish in YouTube says Hawaiian name? Yes. Question mark? Um, it is. Wh what, what's the reasoning for that? Or like, was it somebody from Hawaii who saw this first? Like, Yes, there's a telescope that we have uh, up on Mauna Kea called the Pan Stars Telescope. Gotcha. Um, and it, so Finders Keepers? Yes, Finders, finders Keepers, kind of. And the scientist who discovered it, you know, you get to name it and everything like that. And because it was the first object of its kind, uh, they decided to go with Hawaiian names as a part of the nomenclature for it. And yeah. we'll see if that nomenclature sticks if we find more interstellar objects because typically we try to name things after specific, you know, things like if you look at them, uh, the uh, if you look at Uranus and all the moons around it, it's mm -hmm. named after characters in Shakespeare plays and things oh, like sure. that. Okay. So mm -hmm. we try to stick with, with the specific areas for nomenclature. So we'll see if this one stays. It's kind of like yeah. having a litter of puppies. You yeah. give a theme. Yes, exactly. We theme things when uh -huh. we name stuff. So see, I that's got the way you. it works. Yeah. So all right. It's pretty cool. So. All right. Very, mm -hmm. very cool. Um, so Ben, you sort of alluded to this in news. And, um, a little switcheroo? Yeah, I mean, so Blue Origin is what we're talking about here, and sure. I feel like there are a lot of times where Blue Origin does something really fantastic yep. and doesn't tell anybody about it. Well, they do something until fantastic, they, we learn like two weeks later that they did that's something that's fantastic. That's what I'm yeah. saying. Like, they're, till they're done, they've yep. edited their video and then publish it and go, hey, we did this really oh, cool thing. Oh, by the way, we're on the moon. <laughs> right. So <laughs> right, yeah. We, I saw this title. Who's more secretive, Blue Origin or China? And Blue I Origin a, or China? <laughs> well, there's more cameras in China, apparently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's actually that's a really good comment uh, coming out of our uh, own chat room as opposed to YouTube or Twitch or anywhere else that you would like to comment um, from 
Joel's, oh, it's going too fast. So basically, it says blue who. Go, go there blue you go. Who? Blue who? Mm -hmm. Blue origin, yeah. right? Blue origin. So, um, yes. Yeah, blue so origin. So I was worried when I saw this of like blue origin switches something, I was like, wait, what? What <laughs> happened? Right, so blue origin uh, founded by Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Uh, May know him from Amazon. Fame, Amazon, I believe the currently the richest man in the world. He's in the top like five, right? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's way up there. there. Depends he's on way how up there. Yeah, yeah, right. for blue and origin. if you look at photos from him in 1998 and him now, he's like jacked. He's swole. Oh, yeah. He looks like he, like he ate himself. He does, in fact, out, lift. You know? Not relevant to the story. So, okay. So, um, Blue Origin has a couple different rockets. They have the new Shepard rocket. Uh, you can tell their naming convention really quick. N named off of Alan Shepard. Much like a litter of puppies. Just saying. Go on. <laughs> uh, after Alan Shepard, yes. uh, first American in space, but mm -hmm. it was a suborbital flight. Mm -hmm. It is a suborbital rocket. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, what they're working on now, their first orbital rocket called the New Glenn, named after John Glenn, the first ah. American to successfully orbit the Earth. Uh, now, the New Glenn was supposed to use the BE-4 engines for its first and second stages. Those are methalox engine, mm -hmm. meaning uh, methane and liquid oxygen. Uh, so there you go. There is a BE-4 engine on the screen right now. They are currently developing their BE-4 sea level engines and have made really good strides in doing that. We've actually seen them do a test. It was like a two-minute video on YouTube on a test firing. Ton of information on BE-4. BE-4 will also be used on the upcoming Vulcan rocket from United Launch Alliance. Uh, again, this methalox engine making Great strides. However, the engines you need at sea level are different than the engines that you need up in the vacuum of, a, of space. And so they were going to create essentially... Space is not a vacuum. The near vacuum of space? I'm just, just being clear. What is space then? It's very close to being a vacuum, but the it's near, not actual... The near vacuum of space. I'm just saying. For the purpose of this conversation, we will say the vacuum of space with the understanding that we mean the near vacuum it of space. It is a near perfect vacuum. Right. But we're, you we're, can... right. we're gonna say, we're yeah. just gonna say, because it's not, I'm not gonna say near vacuum every time. Maybe We're gonna should. say, I'm not going to. Go on. So, um, uh, they needed to develop a vacuum optimized version, a near vacuum optimized version of the BE4 engine. Uh, but instead of doing that, what they're going to do is uh, create a near vacuum optimized version of the BE3 engine, which is a Hydrolox engine. The BE3 engine is what you see on that new Shepard rocket that has actually launched before, which means that it is a flight proven engine. However, it's suborbital, so it's never actually been used like full on for extended durations in a orbital mission. So there will be uh, some tweaks required, and that those tweaks will give it a new designation of the BE3U, which is going to be the vacuum near vacuum optimized version of the <sighs> engine. Now there are advantages to the. Oh yeah, you, you started that. It's not my fault that they misnamed their own engine. Go on. <laughs> and you complain about Pluto Planet conventions <laughs> yeah. with everything. So. I'm not the one who started this. I didn't start this. Just saying. Uh, now the BE3 engine actually has a higher specific impulse or ISP than the BE4. engine engine because uh, a Hydrolox engine is just going to be more efficient than a Methalox engine. Just the fuels themselves will, will allow for a more efficient engine. So the BE3 engine actually might be a better fit in space. So they're going to use some of their existing technology and the main reason they're doing this is they want to fly, well at least the main reason we understand they're doing this because, you know, there's it's Blue Origin so I have limited so we data here. To we we have on. to speculate. So this is yep. speculation. <laughs> to be clear, this is Ben speculating. I believe the main reason they want to do this is to maintain a 2020 launch date for the new Glenn rocket. Mm. Ah. Mm -hmm. I was ah. also hearing some speculation that some of those, you know, Department of Defense payloads have to be put into really weird high energy orbits, Could and be. you want to optimize for that. But but also, I thought I thought just Blue, kind of well, hang on. I around, thought that so. Blue Origin was in an agreement with United Launch Alliance that they would not launch. Um, D, uh, military payloads, and that that would all be done on the Vulcan rocket. Oh, I don't. I, don't uh, I thought that was the case. Do, do chat room, so. do correct me if I'm wrong. But someone I'm, will correct us. Yeah, no. so. I'm sure. Oh, they will. Uh, yes. There is a, a question in the chat room yeah. uh, from Rebel Ace Friesland uh, saying, "Where are the BE two and one?" Um, if anybody knows. That's actually a great question. As far as I know, they started like they started flying with the BE three. That's the first thing I heard as uh, well. Uh, that was back, like, all of this started back in 2012, mm -hmm. where, where the designs, so the only, I'm not sure. The only thing I can think of is that um, if you are ever here in the States and you are looking at ketchup, and there's uh, there's a couple of different brands, there's one that's Heinz 57, and it says 57 on it because it was like the 57th formula 
that they got to, and it was like, ah, Eureka, this is the one we want. Um, so I don't know if maybe the BE1 was total crap and BE2 was a little bit better, but BE3 was like actually good. Um, but that would be my theory. In the early 2000s, they actually did develop a BE1, which used peroxide as a ah. propellant. It generated about 2,000 pounds of thrust. Sure. And then they went on to the BE2, which was a bipropellant engine using kerosene and peroxide, nice. generating 31,000 pounds Boom! of thrust. Boom! Internet for the win on a live You're show. You're welcome. There you go. No need to comment. There you go. Yeah. We got it. Uh, yeah, Reveille, Reveille says, so. Wiki says they exist, but not that they flew. All right. Um, I mean, cool. sure. you don't Neat. have to fly every engine you make. That's right. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah. All right. Moving right. on. Yeah. Uh, all right. So, Jared, uh, you thankfully, you went to the bathroom before the show, so I know you're not talking about <laughs> well, yourself. I still spilt water on myself. I feel like that was During more information show. than was required. So, yeah. It doesn't matter now. Uh, so, but... Uh, what's with the planets being too wet? Yeah, so, you know, I always try to tell people, you know, stay hydrated. Right. And, uh, and, you know, it's really important. And I accidentally hydrated my shirt a little bit, too. Um, that, you know, dampening the expectations of life is not exactly something that we would expect. You're welcome yep, I got uh, it. for that one. But there's been a study <laughs> that's come from scientists at Arizona State and Vanderbilt University um, that is looked at the recently discovered TRAPPIST-1 solar system uh, and they've realized that they likely have too much water to support life. Now, Trappist-1 has what? seven planets that are about the size of the Earth, and they are very tightly packed together. This is a great, uh, a great image that shows you just how tightly packed they are. Up on the top there is Jupiter and its four Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. On the bottom is the actual size of the Trappist-1 system, uh, with the planets a lot bigger than they actually are. But that's the actual distances. You could literally almost fit the first two planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system within the distance from Jupiter to its furthest Galilean moon, Callisto. So it's an itty-bitty system. And it can be itty-bitty because the TRAPPIST-1 star is a red dwarf star, so it's an itty-bitty star. Now this would fit well within the orbit of Mercury around our sun. And because that red dwarf star is cooler than our sun, the habitable zone is a lot closer, so some of these planets are actually sitting in that habitable zone. However, these planets, they're not similar in mass to our Earth. They're actually much less dense, even though they're about the size of the Earth. They're too light to be rocky planets, but they're also uh, too compact to be made mostly of atmospheric gases. And if they were able to hold on to the atmospheric gases, the light curves would appear puffier than they actually do, but they don't. They're very sharp light curves. So with gas and rock out of the game, water was factored in. And just how much water was needed to make up for the mass deficits was unknown. So the team looked at the chemical composition of the host star, Trappist-1 there, along with the mass and radius of each planet, and software was created that determined that the innermost planets, B and C, have less than 15% water by mass. And two of the outer planets, F and G, have over 50% water by mass. Now, if that doesn't sound like a lot of water by mass, let's compare it to the Earth, which only has 0.02% oh. water by mass. Wow, that's a lot lower than I thought it was going to be. Yes. yes. I was I figured like everything's that. ocean, so it would this be... This isn't just an order yeah. of magnitude more. This is like several orders of magnitude more water on these planets if it is if there is water there with them uh, with that now of course we know liquid water is one of the three critical components that life as we currently understand it needs to exist. The other are schnapps, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and a source of energy, be it photosynthesis or chemosynthesis. Now, too much water can actually hinder habitability as the geochemistry that can help kickstart life doesn't occur if there's a little surface above the water for it to interact and mix in with, mm. uh, as we understand it. So life could be radically different, but right like now we have- primordial goo? Yeah, 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 sort of that, that ooze, if you will, Okay, it but starts like, at, so. what about uh, water bears, tardigrades? What about them? Well, I mean, their name, their yeah, well, their they, street name is water bear. Like, yeah, yeah, but you still need the primordial goo. Yeah, you still need essentially the ability of water and rock to mix together and generate chemistry. At least as okay. we currently understand things, currently, mm -hmm. um, you need that mix of water and rock uh, to actually work with that. And if you okay. have a water planet, you likely don't have any mix, any mixing of water and rock like you need to generate that kind of chemistry. Okay. So, yeah, and it's, uh, it's uh, wild, so. 
All right. Yeah. It's wild. It's, it's, it's wet and wild. So. Wow. No, mm. I think that's a different thing. Um, yeah, all I right. Think so. so. You know, after dark is next, right? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> no, what so. is next is we're going to be taking a little bit of a calendar break, and when we come back, we're going to do our roundtable discussion about. Oh, this, this is going to be an easy one, you guys. Uh, why humanity? What's holding back humanity from living amongst the <laughs> stars? So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quit or fumble little fashion lines. Fill the thoughts of expectation. This girl's a fascination. And nothing in her way will keep her from her destination. Cause she's fire walking. She's fire walking. When it's hot, she keeps on moving. And tomorrow continues with our roundtable discussion. But before we get into that, a special thank you to all of the citizens of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to tomorrow. We also have our orbital citizens. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, head on over to makersupport.com slash TMRO. I also want to say that uh, this is the first show we're doing with our brand new shiny website. It's pretty yes. cool over at tmro.tv. So do let us know what you think. It was uh, it was it was many many weeks in the making, and you know mm -hmm. lots of back and forth. So uh, again, let us know what you think of the brand new website and check it out. It's pretty cool. Also, uh, hi guys. Uh, our the people who helped make the website uh, said they're our new biggest fans, and so oh. you better be watching. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's from uh, OneWeekWebsite.com. One Week Website, really great people to work with. All right, uh, let's uh, uh, let's go into our main topic, uh, which is uh, what is currently holding humanity back from our next cosmic steps. Um, <laughs> so, Jared. <we> <laughs> <laughs> Do you want? Should I just? Should I just? Like Whatever you like. Out there? Yeah. Well, let's hold us back from our next. What you like? Well, I mean, let's set let's set the stage here, right? Sure. You know, we we went to the moon in 1969. We, we sure kind did. Of, that was one of the first big steps out of our uh, home planet, right? We mm -hmm. we left our home planet, left the safety of Earth. We went to the moon. Mm -hmm. It was a little step, but still, you know, a, a big monumental thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. 1972. Last time we've done that. Mm -hmm. The next time we went to the moon was never. We yeah. have never returned to the moon. We have not gone to Mars. We have not explored anything past that from a humanity standpoint. Now, mm -hmm. we send tons of robots, and robots are awesome, but no humans have gone out mm -hmm. past the moon ever, other than, like, if you count, like, an Apollo 8 slingshot sort, yep. sort of mm -hmm. thing. I think the furthest out a human was was Apollo 13. Yes. yes. Right? The, uh, the Correct. Like, yep. So... Why? What's holding us back from going back to the moon, going on to Mars, going to Jupiter? Well, you're not going to land in Jupiter, but well, the you, moon's I, suppose Jupiter. You, I suppose you could. Absolutely. The moon's in <laughs> Jupiter. You absolutely could. Uh, for me, it's two things that are holding back humanity. Cash and consistency. So those are the two main things. Cash and consistency. Cash and consistency. It's a little alliterative, so, so that's easy to remember. Yes. So um, it's sort of, especially with cash, it's the old adage, no bucks, no buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. So if you actually want to um, have the missions of humanity, uh, humans are a lot more finicky than robots. They require things like food and air and water and radiation protection mm -hmm. and other things and entertainment. To somehow keep them busy. The cosmos isn't entertaining in and of itself? Yeah, uh, it is, uh, but you you still have to psychologically have some sort of connection back with where you've come from, or else things start to get a little interesting um, with that there. I think you can talk <laughs> a little bit fun. to that. Yeah. Uh, so, well, so, no, so, right, no, talk about that. Why, yeah. Actually, why? Why? What, what's the, why is entertainment holding us... Uh, I mean, you didn't say that, but I'm, I'm putting it on you now, sure. Josh. Also, we don't have a name better for you, but uh, Josh. Future I'm Martian. Hi. Yeah, that yeah, was. Future Martian. Yeah. So uh, why, why is entertainment, entertainment important? Um, because people go bonkers without it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> they run around is that actually, is that actually savage. Is, well, you've got to be able to stimulate the brain. So it's this idea that uh, if you're not engaged in some shape or form, you're not using your brain. So when something really drastic happens, you're not ready to respond to it. So, so entertainment is the wrong word, it's engagement that yeah, we're looking for. Yeah, it's about for. utilizing your brain and having something that you're kind of interested in, involved in. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't have to be entertaining. You don't have to be sitting there watching like reality TV. It needs to be something that is engaging. 
So that what I was going to say, yeah, reality TV, yeah, yeah. not <laughs> interesting. Uh, just to be clear about that. Go on. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's there's it. An, there's an irony there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we just watch a show about ourselves. Uh, uh, so in, in your opinion, what's holding humanity back from taking our next cosmic steps? Nationalism. Nationalism, me, all, interesting. It kind of boils down to this whole focus on where we come from, which patch of dirt we were born on, and we lay claim to such and such a country. And it's the idea of us as a species moving out into the solar system and exploring yeah. further. We kind of, the US got to the moon and it was something that was done for all of humankind. But it was also because they were racing the Russians to get there. So sure. this idea that we're kind of somehow competing against each other is crazy. NASA's just celebrating this $20 billion budget. But wait a minute, but wait a minute. That competition got us to the moon. When no, the competition ended, so did our reaching out to the cosmos. But the drive for, to actually go there in the first place mm -hmm. was not about wanting to explore the cosmos. It was about wanting to go out and prove that we but could... The question but isn't, the... the question is not, what what will, ex will we explore our drive, like, yeah. What, 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 the question didn't inc include drive for so going out there. My argument is they got there and they were already talking about cancelling Apollo after Apollo 11. And you saw that happen with the J-Class missions. Actually, fun fact, Toy, they were talking about canceling Apollo before, before Apollo, Apollo 11. 11. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just, uh, you know, I always want to throw this out here in the historical context that po Apollo was not a popular thing during its time period. No, actually, it space was only, is more popular now than it was in the Apollo It era. was only after Apollo when really, especially in the 80s, when people started going back and visiting it historically and studying it, that then the rise in the romanticism of space flight kind of became a thing. During its time, it was a deeply unpopular project. People thought that, that we're not getting anything out of this, so what's the point of spending all this money to send two guys to walk on the moon? Now, we can look back now and go like, oh yeah, look at all the technology and all of the, 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 uh, the, the bringing together of people that we were able to get out of that, but, but at that time, it was a deeply unpopular thing. So. Karen, in your opinion, what is holding humanity back from our next cosmic steps? Um, I, I think it's a combination of a lot of things, uh, but I, my initial response was humanity. Hmm. I elaborate. So um, Vax had a, a comment very specifically in here somewhere uh, saying, yeah, the only thing holding us back is the will to go. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess that's kind of like if I have to pick a particular camp to fight with, that, that's the one. Um, you know, people say money, people say politics, people, you know, nationalism. I think it's it's all kind of in there to a certain extent. But yeah, if we just sort of laid down all of our dumb crap and said, we're going to do this, it does not matter what the answer is or what what is wrong, right? I don't care that you're Russian, I'm American, he's Australian and he's from China. Doesn't matter. We need to do this together. I don't care how much it costs. Actually, you know what? It doesn't cost anything anymore. Everyone's going to do this because this is the right thing to do, right? What's the joke about uh, the the asteroid uh, detection? Oh yeah, uh, asteroids and comets are nature's way of saying how's that space it's program coming along? Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so. so we have a big enough rock coming at us. We're going to pull some sort of Armageddon, Bruce Willis kind of situation, and we're going to band together and we're going to figure it out and we're going to go. And we have to do this before, like, Bruce yeah, no, Willis is getting old, yeah. right. so yeah. we have a problem there, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, we, we definitely have to do it, we definitely have to do it before then, but, uh, um, yeah, I think it's it's the will, and I think the will is, is to a certain extent, weak enough to go, well, we don't have enough money, and, oh, I don't know what to do, and I don't want to do it with him, though, because he's not from my country. Like, no, 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 if you're going to do it, you're going to do it, period. But, so that, I mean... Yeah, right. We could choose to do this, but that also seems a bit idealistic, right? I mean, we are more divided now as a peoples than like than I have ever seen. Well, so we all hate Mark Zuckerberg. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> She's not wrong, and he knows it because he's watching everybody. I didn't so. That to go that so, way. <laughs> cool. You just, you did you did you hear that? <laughs> did you hear watch that? me say it. It's fine. <laughs> Did, did you hear that one? <laughs> Alexa, winter is coming. Um, I, look, I, whatever, right? We just, if we can find enough things to band together on, and that just seems like 
yes, yes, I have a very sunny disposition when it comes to all the things that wonderful things that humans can do. But there, time and time again, somebody's like, what do you mean I can't just buy a Russian rocket? Okay, I guess <laughs> I'll just make my own then. Yeah, yeah so <laughs> I, I kind of want to piggyback on what you said with yeah. the, sort of the will of people to go. Carl yeah. Sagan brought up a really interesting point in one of his books, which is that as a species begins to move itself out from its home, do, there's a choice the species has to make. It has to either say, I'm willing to be uncomfortable and go further beyond my limits, or I'm going to retract back to where I've gone because I've gone there and I've experienced it and I don't want to go beyond the limits of what my species is capable of. Based on that, we have chosen to retract back then we... because we, have, we went to the moon in the 60s and early 70s, right. and we have not gone back since. We have chosen to not go back. I would say we've not fully retracted. We just we just sort of uh, broke what was my second uh, thing point that I brought up, besides funding, which was consistency, consistency of goal. Mm. Um, you know, we retreated back to low Earth orbit for better or for worse. That's we could literally have another round table about that if yeah. we wanted to. Um, but we didn't retreat fully. We didn't say we're not going to start, we're not going to explore space anymore. We're done. We're staying on this rock forever. We just decided to go a different route because we thought that route might be a little bit better than this big rocket route. You know, we're going to build a reusable spacecraft to build a space station to study what happens to humans when they stay in space for a really long time. Now we found out that the type of reusability that they use is the wrongest type of reusability. Oh, Refurbishability. Oh, I'm so, I can't. Oh so, my god, it hurts. Yeah, it, it's not. Like that's what we said is a hu <laughs> like a human species. That's ridiculous. Yeah. But that's... you were also saying before, like there's more people supporting exploring space than ever before than even during the 60s when they went there. You but we're doing less. Well, that's, that's not a fair statement you, from a human standpoint. But you can also look at it as like early adoption of technology. You've got the technology adoption curve where Apollo was the early adopters going out doing something extreme. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now there's a larger population of people who are coming on board as the technology becomes more available. More people are saying this is a thing we should do. So Is the technology yeah. becoming more available? We talk a lot about, especially on this show, all the future stuff that's coming up. I just talked about uh, Blue Origins, upcoming uh, New Glenn uh, rocket. They've got a new Armstrong rocket coming out after that sometime. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, one can imagine where that's going to go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but none of these things are out, right? SpaceX talks about the the BFR, the Big Falcon rocket. It's not a thing. Uh, you know, we talk about the Space Launch System. It's not a thing. We, you know, all of these things that are supposed to push humanity out there, we talk about them a lot. Yeah. But, but nothing is shipping. We literally, SpaceX is literally landing rockets, though. That's something that was talked about for decades as being impossible, and in the space of, what, 15 years? It starts happening. Someone comes yeah. along and says, let's use what's available now, and we'll start doing something that was claimed to be impossible for 30, 40 years. I feel like once space becomes sort of an everyday thing that affects your life greatly, that's when it's really going to end up... Uh, sort of. How sort does of, it impact your everyday life greatly? What what in space? I, what in human exploration of the cosmos will create that? I feel like um, you know this is probably going to be wildly incorrect, and we can replay it in five years on. Orbit I'm excited 16. for this moment. <laughs> um, but I, everyone, <laughs> record this. I feel like with the, the all these internet constellations coming online and stuff like that, that's really going to get people interested in spaceflight because the internet is one of those things that is almost like you need it at this point to basically do just about anything, for better or for worse, um, with how we are as a species. Um, and when you're going to be able to have the access to that as low a cost at as high a speed as is being said at the moment, we'll see if that actually translates um, with it there. But um, once something like that happens and you realize the importance of deploying things like this, that should be able to do it. I also feel like once you start making money in space, like actually doing things in space, like if yeah. It, but again, I keep feeling like once you get do this, and then once you do that, and then once you do that, like yeah, there there definitely has to be a, a process, a process to the entire thing, right? Like you you can't you can't uh, you can't run before or you can't jump before you run, right? And that's the saying. Um, I, I, yes, there there has to be milestones to hit. Don't get me wrong, can't be like, we're gonna go! And be like Mr. Flat Earther with the steam engine thing going on. Like you can't, <laughs> you can't just do that because yeah. you, 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 we're not fairies, you can't clap it into existence and just mm -hmm. make it a thing. Um, but at the same time, like I feel as though 
Granted, I said the word feel and not think, but I feel as though we continually look at things. And there's somebody in the chat room that actually had a really great comment. Um, Travis Neal off of YouTube says, I, I don't buy fear. People take bigger steps and punch through fear. It's all about establishing the monetary value in space operations. But that also still says to me, like, well, until we know how to make money in space, then, then we'll go. Like, no, just go. It's like, easy to say when you're not footing the bill. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I can barely keep this show alive sometimes. Like, I, yeah, I understand that. But I, but I guess if there's a big enough... <sighs> this, is, this, this is the sunny disposition in me, right? Like, if we just all do it together, though, right? Like, isn't the internet supposed to be bringing all these people together? Oh, the internet does the no. opposite of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's why I, I mean, yeah, that sounds does. great on paper, it but that is not how Mark this works. Zuckerberg, or until we get really upset that SpaceX is just throwing away boosters now because, you know, we can land them, so why aren't we always landing them? Um, you know, I, I, I just, yeah, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because the internet's definitely going to hate me really soon, I guess. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's how that sounds to me. That's how that ends up sounding to me is like, well, we don't know how to do it. We It costs too much. It's too much a pain in the butt. Like, we don't know if we're going to make money. Like, we're going to wait until we do make money. Then we'll put people up there. Oh, no, you definitely have to put robots first because people are expensive and they're gooey and we have to keep them safe. Like... <sighs> a, co a common theme I'm hearing is money and people, right? So yeah. nationalism, people, mm -hmm. you know, co common goals kind of goes back to people, but you got to be able to fund it. But you look at uh, an entity like NASA, NASA is uh, one of the, if not the largest privately funded entities for exploration on the planet, mm -hmm. right? More so than, it's, it's about 50-50. I believe NASA has about 50% of the worldwide budget. Uh, we're talking Private, not military, right? So military is a whole different bucket. But 50% of the budget and the rest of the world combined has the other 50%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about, well, you know, no bucks, no buck Rogers, but they have the bucks. Like, they have billions of dollars every year. They do, but they also don't have consistency in their goals. If you look at every administration in where they have decided to send that, that agency, it's been all over the place. Kennedy, we're going to the moon. Uh, Johnson, we're doing Kennedy's legacy. Uh, Nixon came in. I don't want to do any of that. Make it cheap. Build the shuttle. Carter? Uh, uh, Reagan, um, <laughs> Reagan, you're flying everything on that shuttle, and it's gonna, and we're gonna do a lot more military stuff. Actually, than you the really way Carter to. Carter said, uh, actually, there's a lot of people down here on Earth that are kind of suffering. If we could just yeah, on Carter that for was kind of that's <laughs> why hands in the air. Kind of with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bush won. No, we're sending humans to Mars. Right. Clinton, no, we're gonna build a space station with the Russians. Bush, too. No, we're gonna go to the moon. Then we're gonna go to Mars. Obama, no, we're gonna take an asteroid to the moon and visit the asteroid. <laughs> And then maybe go to the moon. And now we've got another administration <laughs> that's basically things. like, hey, we're going to the moon. We'll see how that happens. Via a deep uh, space gateway. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. No, excuse me, LOPG. So Lunar Orbital Platform I'm sorry, gateway. Stargate? What did you just say? Uh, then, <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. There's been no I'm so like, sorry. But, no, Neuropol look, nails that. Neuropol uh, has nailed that perfectly of SpaceX CEO, we're going to Mars. Like, that's what... Elon founded SpaceX based on and has stuck with that. Yeah, and if you look at NASA's science directorate and what they've done, especially with their Mars exploration, where they basically have said, follow the water, and they've been saying that since the early 90s. Mm. And they've been doing that consistently with their Mars exploration, as opposed to what's happening in the Human Spaceflight Division, which is sort of at the whim of whatever executive br branch wants to do at that time. Um, they have been getting incredible results out of incredible work with things like that. and. And that consistency is really, really key. If you don't have the, if you don't have a consistent goal, if your goal is constantly shifting, then you're gonna, you're gonna be on sands that are constantly shifting, and you can't stand on that. So we talk about gonna sink deep into it, and you're gonna just. All waste right. So it. as long as as we're all chanting, go with the water or find the water. What was it? What did you say? I'll follow the water. Follow the water. Mm -hmm. Then we're golden. Period. Ish. Right, because it's money. <laughs> Can you translate that into a couple other languages? Uh, like what? Like, I, don't, I don't know anything. Like, well, I mean, water is an important thing. Cool. So Great. So if, if, we could all and, say the same things then, yeah. and we can all get behind it. Right. Right. So, so you, we talk about money. I think we just solved world peace. Yeah. Go on. We talk about money inconsistency, right? And, yeah. and you talked a little bit, you a neuropilot, and you brought up this point. You know, when when it comes to governments, there's no consistency, but there is money. But in in private. Uh, aerospace, there's generally been consistency, but no money, mm -hmm. or at least not the money at the level that we need now. But we've got w a 
you know, Jeff Bezos, mm -hmm. who, as much as I give him trouble for being super secretive, he's got the money. I mean, if he... Yeah, he's, he's just like, you know... Yeah, he may, hey, right? you, you need something? <laughs> Here you go, right? I mean, he's building so. this on his own dime. <laughs> yeah. He's just, he's just making this happen. So mm -hmm. I can, you know, as a media show, obviously, I'm like, I want more stuff, but... I mean, he's actually making it happen, so I should probably just shut up and let him make it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and he's probably got, he has the ability to be consistent. So is that our future? Is our future in these private companies where you've got these billionaires that are like, you know what? No, we're going to the moon. We're going to Mars. We're going to create mm -hmm. uh, a, you know, I, I think Bezos is more about uh, the cislunar stuff than he yeah, is Mars. Yeah, working with the ULA on their cislunar 1000. Cislunar being so, the space yeah. in between Earth and, and the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, kind of... That you know, proximity area. Yeah, yeah, so, kind of, yeah. you know, we'll say Earth-moon, right? Kind yeah. of, you, you know, using that as our st stepping stone. Mm -hmm. is, is that where, is that is that what we're going to need to get moving forward? Maybe I should clarify the nationalism comment before. That's kind of where I was going with it, where you're starting to see these these transnational com companies coming along and saying, we're going to do this, and it doesn't matter which country we're based out of. Oh, we'll base it out of the US because there's a heritage there. But like Rocket Labs is a great example of let's launch out of New Zealand. But mm -hmm. we're based in the US because that's easier to work on the administrative side of things, sure. but we'll build it in New Zealand or we'll go and work in different areas based on wherever and stepping beyond the borders. The whole thing of seeing Earth from above and not being able to see borders should apply to the way we build spacecraft as well. The overview effect. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like, um, th especially with the rise of private space flight over the past uh, sort of half a decade, um, when things have really started pouring on and becoming like, like, oh, yeah, they, they really are starting to make a lot of progress with this now. Um, I feel like uh, private companies are definitely going to end up leading the way with human spaceflight in our local area, sort of going to the moon and Mars. And I feel like private uh, public partnerships are going to be the way to go with that. NASA is definitely going to buy some rides from whoever has spacecraft ready to go. Um, in, in, in addition, those companies will probably also have their own astronauts flying as well. And I think that's a fantastic way to go about that. I feel like though for science, as the way things are coming along, um, you know, it's very, I, I would imagine that as great as a lot of these private companies are, it'd be very difficult to, to justify expending $3 billion to land something on Europa, drill through 10 kilometers of ice and try to take images of what may be in the ocean underneath that ice. But that would be really cool. That would be sick if a private company could do that. And it would also be amazing, too, if that private company that gathers that data decides to do what we do as scientists, which is basically there is an embargo period where the principal investigator and their team gets to look at that data, and then it gets released to anybody who ever wants to use it. Mm -hmm. It'd be really cool if we didn't sort of, like I've seen people suggest, which is that a private company paywall the data with everything with that. And sure, it's their data. They gather it. If they want to charge people for it, they can. Um, but... Um, you yeah, know, but, it, it'd be really great to have both of them working together and enabling that. And, you know, you can even do a public-private partnership with a mission to something like Europa. You're purchasing the launch vehicle from a private company um, that has specifically designed this in order to lower the cost to enable exploration of things like this. But it can't just be science, right? We, we, that's oh, essentially no, 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 all no. we're doing right now in space is science. Yeah. And if we want to expand and actually grow, you know, grow past Earth and move into the cosmos, it's going to have to be a lot more than just yeah. you know and that's why here's a scientific reason reason for doing it. We need we need a lot more than that. That's why I really like uh, the question that we ask our our guests when they come on, which is you know human or robotic exploration of the cosmos. And Everyone answers and, both. And I'm and I'm very much in the that area where I, where my answer to that is yes because both are super essential. I think 100 percent of the so, people have answered both. I so. don't think anyone has ever said oh only humans or only robots. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, Dada, our director, actually had an interesting comment. Uh, which is uh, there will be an endless supply of not untils that will prevent us from doing it not because uh, because we're looking for a reason not to do it we already has a reason to do it let's get together and do it it's always uh, that's I think that's true just in life in general right it's mm -hmm. always easy to find the reason not to do something or this is too hard this is too difficult I can't get started until X Y or Z uh, but it, you know you just need to actually just go out and yeah. start you just and that is I think sometimes the hardest part of a project Project. Mm -hmm. It's just beginning and, you know, making it happen. Especially when you're at the beginning where you really don't know which way it's going to go. Mm. Either you're like, man, I don't, I don't know if this is going to work or not. 
Like, there's a very high probability that this is going to fail. And that's a very difficult decision to say, okay, if it fails, it fails. We're going for it, though. So, and that's really tough to think about. So. There's a friend of mine who's involved with a business school at the moment and totally different sort of decided track, but they plan around these, these three-month clusters, this sort of let's work on a particular project for the next three months, and they plan them out across uh, three years, so 12 of these projects, and they expect six of them to fail. Wow. Like that's right from the start. It's yeah. like, yeah, one in two is going to fail, and the ones that do work will push on from there. And that's like an expectation in business yeah. of this is what we should be expecting. Is our lack of accepting a failure also holding us back? Uh, going to the chat room again, Cogent7, cost of human space flight would probably be cheaper if they kept safety goals at shuttle or Apollo levels rather than the high standards they demand now. Um, I mean, obviously we want people to be safe, but Look, there, yeah. there's a point where it's absurd. Uh, yeah, he, go ahead. I, as I always just say, if you kill astronauts, you lose customers. That's true. So, but yeah, I mean, I guess the other the other side of that argument is mm -hmm. that there are people who are willing to do it, mm -hmm. and who am I to tell you that you can't? Yeah. Like, I'm going to do everything I can to keep you as safe as I possibly can for as yeah. long as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. But if you're willing to do it, how can I tell you no? It's also, risk acceptance, and this is kind of the government thing coming back mm -hmm. again. Government astronauts are government employees. They are representing that country, and so they need to come back safely to tell everyone how great their particular country's or like their space agency is. And so there's an element there of we have to represent, so they have to bring them back safely. Mm -hmm. And that's maybe where private starts to come in. I think like, that's where mm. nationalist ego comes in, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? And almost almost to a detrimental point. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, just assign everyone a... a um, an autobiographer, a biographer, right? Like, just everyone's got like somebody that they're gonna. So in case I die, you tell my story. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Moving on. Awesome. Like, yeah. I, 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 I don't, I don't mean to sound that cold-hearted about it. No, I get where you're coming from because I am one of those people. Right. And I strap I'm, me uh, to it. I'm, I'm willing not, to take the chance. Right. That's you know, definitely uh, not me. But like, great. Please do because that way I don't have to. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll st I'm still gonna argue for safety. You oh, know, okay. to do things. Yeah. But I am willing. I understand the risk behind it. I mean, there's a re that really great quote from John Young, which is, anyone who sits on top of the largest hydrogen oxygen fueled system in the world, knowing that they're going to light the bottom and doesn't get a little worried, does not fully understand the situation. Yeah. <laughs> so, when, you know. And there's so. the Gus Grissom one as well of space is worth dying for. Yeah. That, that was something mm -hmm. that they accepted and he did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so that's, yeah, that risk accept acceptance is... But we don't seem to be willing to take that risk acceptance. Uh, Johnny Boy mentions in the chat room, uh, death is bad for space industry public relations. Uh, Tends to be. I, you know, I mean, it's going to be bad for anything, right? Yeah. I mean, but, yeah. it, you know, you're going to... I mean, not to sound cold-hearted, you're going to have death in all industry well, somehow. People, people will die, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. People going, died crossing the Atlantic. People died going across the United States. And people to, die from eating too much Coast. French fries. Like, absolutely. Just have somebody go who wants to go. I mean, on average, two people are killed every year by vending machines. Honestly. So. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so so I, there's, I don't there's, think, there's I don't think we're promoting that people should die, but we, should, we no. need no, to be willing but, to accept that yeah. risk. Now, I've seen people in the space industry basically say that safety should be kept asunder and that you're on your own with that and I'm like not on board with any of that kind of attitude towards yeah there's anything. a there's a huge difference between so. a, a a car seat belt safety belt and like a five-point harness <laughs> like huge difference yeah that really should be considered mm -hmm. yeah but also if you if you consider that yeah there's it works for, with it so, so. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> that actually ends up, I think, in a pretty good wrap point for everything. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, I'll ask the original question again there based on this conversation. There are a million <laughs> comments of coming from all of the different chat rooms. Hi there. We see your comments from Twitch. We see your comments from YouTube. We see your comments in the regular chat room. Um, this is why we have these conversations. Don't get me wrong. I'm sorry we didn't get to more of them. Hopefully we hit we some got of to, them. We got to a good chunk of them. I'm looking at the chat room. Them, yeah. we got, uh, but, yeah, um, I, I'm going to go around the table one more time asking the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, based on this conversation, if you could summarize your answer in like one sentence or less. I think you did a pretty good job in the beginning, but based on the, if anything changed, what is currently holding back humanity from our next cosmic steps? Uh, no bucks, no Buck Rogers, and no consistent goal. What is currently holding humanity back from our next cosmic steps? The will to do it. The patch of dirt that they call home. 
All right. Uh, and I would love to know what you think uh, in our chat rooms. Leave your comments on YouTube, Face, uh, yeah, Facebook. <laughs> it's just oh, it's for a little while. It's fine. <laughs> for now. Nobody YouTube. comments there anyway, yeah. let's be fair. <laughs> yeah. YouTube, Facebook, uh, <laughs> Twitch, or our uh, brand new shiny website, tmro.tv. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from our last week's show. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. Science. It both draws us together and tears us apart. Brings discoveries to cure us and threaten us. It is neither good nor evil. It is what we decide to make of it. There is so much more to learn. And we are curious. Together, let's explore the science of tomorrow. And tomorrow continues. Now, before we get into comments from our last week's show, a huge shout out to all of the patrons of tomorrow. Nope, the citizens of tomorrow who have helped make this specific <laughs> this episode happen. These are Escape Velocity citizens. I'm glad you enjoyed that. <sighs> that but, you know, Daddy hasn't been on the show for a while, so he's a little rusty <laughs> still. Because Daddy still writes the script. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We also have our overall citizens. These are people who contributed $5 or more per episode or $15 per month on Maker Support and our suborbital system. <laughs> citizens at $2.50 per episode or $5 a month on makersupport.com. Uh, to find out how you can become a citizen tomorrow, head on over to tmro.tv, and then there's a little support us tab on that uh, uh, area now. All right. Uh, last week, uh, we actually had Space Mike in-house, mm -hmm. which was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had a great interview with Dr. Chris McKay from the NASA Ames Research Center uh, for on the search of life in our solar system. So Capcom, what were some of the comments from that show? <laughs> As opposed to us saying like, well, sure, I mean, let's search for life, uh, but you know, we humans, we're just gonna stay here. That's cool. <laughs> uh, the first comment comes <laughs> off of YouTube uh, from Lucas Goosen. I'm going to uh, <laughs> zoom. It says, I, I would love it if you labeled celestial bodies images. That way, by watching tomorrow, I could probably start recognizing them on site. It would make the show more educational for sure. Yeah. I think that's a fascinating idea. I don't idea. have a problem with that. Labeling so. celestial body images. Yeah, mm -hmm. like here's an image of Enceladus. So at the bottom, you put Enceladus. Mm -hmm. huh. You know? Something All right. like that. So, uh, I, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. and actually, we could so. just create a library of images, although that would get boring really pretty quickly. But yeah, mm -hmm. all right, I, I guess. I mean, but different angles of something, are you still gonna, okay, that's fair. All right. I mean, there's only so much data we have of like certain things, you know, like the uh, planet Pluto. Uranus and Neptune, we have like very, we have Voyager 2's data set. That's we should, it. We so. should hand, send a human out there to snap some pics. Yeah, some that selfies. ought to do it. That'll some be selfies. cheap, won't it? Some yeah. selfies. Some selfies. Yeah. Well, I was introduced to and Snapchat yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, all right. I took a picture with Uranus. <laughs> next. <laughs> After Dark is up next. It's up next. <laughs> <laughs> next Sorry. up, Capcom. Keep timing. forgetting. Um, uh, next comment also, actually, these all come off of YouTube. I'm just going to stop saying it. This one comes from <laughs> Today's Star says, is it possible Thule was, is pronounced Thule? What, what I guess that would be aimed at me for uh, yeah. last week talking Hence about me the, looking at you. the nickname for 2014 MU69, which I ended up explaining to everybody. Mm -hmm. um, the insane, crazy naming yeah. convention. And we then were we, were at, we were at Disney. Uh -huh. We were It's a fun story. We were at Disney after the show, a little, little team building something, something. And we're mm -hmm. like, all right, explain to us the episode number of our next upcoming show using the... Uh, the, that the, same exact convention, yeah, and it was it was a good five ten minutes of conversation to try to figure out yeah. how to get that episode number correct. It's difficult. It's difficult. Someone I could use explain. the word tedious. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> one would say tedious. Yeah. Yes, yeah, I must have been drinking because I do not remember this conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think we should have been drinking. Um, probably but should have been. yeah, uh, just to kind of pronounce it, Thule, Thule. I think Thule. I I think Thule I said it incorrectly Thule? during the show. Thule. Thule. So, Thule. Ultima Thule. Oh. So, yeah, I think I mispronounced it, so. But, it's way better than MU-69. You know, 2014 MU-69, so. I get that there's a system, yeah. but just because you have a system doesn't mean it's good. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, things, uh, we, we've, we're discovering things at such a high rate that we're, we can't keep up with naming them. So that's why they have these technical designations for such a long period of time. That's fine, know? but so. the, the technical designation, that convention, 
is is crazy. Okay, well, come up with a better one, and then go to the international astronomical. I feel, like, astronomical I feel like five minutes of my time. I can come up with. I can take less time to come up with a better convention than it takes to figure out the current convention. Okay, well, in After Dark, I suggest that you get out a piece of paper and a crayon, and you work on it, and you try to figure out how to make that. A new system, okay? I, I do enjoy that. I think that is a fantastic idea. <laughs> like all my R's have to be backwards. Yes. Like drawing, like oh, like with my left hand drawing like this. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I think if you put a little happy face at the bottom of it, <laughs> then the then International it Astronomical like, Union will actually like, listen to you. I think you. your convention so, is stupid. Here you go. So, It'll be like on a napkin with crayon. It's gonna so, be brilliant. We're gonna have to lie to them when you submit it and say that you were five, though. <laughs> sure, <laughs> so, sure. Th so, so thank Mike you, Brown, boys. if you're listening, put a little happy face at the bottom, maybe they'll make Pluto a planet again. <laughs> Alright, next up, Capcom. <clears throat> Alright, uh, comes from uh, James Frondeskis? Frondeskis. Frondeskis. Yes. Uh, says, a great interview, but failed to mention that others going to U going to Europa, like ESA, European Space Agency, but did mention other quote-unquote private companies. Uh, and then a lovely link, so that we would know we were wrong. Yes. <clears throat> I don't, I mean... You, you know, in a show like this, especially when it's live, you're not going to hit every single ob Like, we're not going to sit there and thank every single person. Uh, much like I called Heinz 57 a ketchup. I apologize for that. Oh, too. yeah, I had that, that actually in the, uh, that I, was a chat. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a tomato pick? This is uh, like no, hashtag Carrie Ann apologizes uh, for having not been uh, on air for a couple of weeks. Um, there's a lot of things I need to apologize for, so there's that. Just a blanket statement is probably best. Yeah. Um, well, Ben looks for that. The next com the next comment actually kind of ties in with this a little bit, so we're just going to go ahead and throw them both together. Uh, from SP123, again, I keep saying 1,000, even though it's 100. It says, great interview. Would have liked to have known what his opinions were on the recent speculations of subsurface ocean on Cirrus. Cirrus? Series. Series. Great. Yeah. Uh, I feel the investigation into residual inter internal heating on the full range of solar system bodies should be a definite target for future exploration. I believe InSight will be trying this on Mars. Question yeah, they're going to have a uh, heat flow probe that they're going to basically knock about 10 meters into the surface of Mars um, to see if there's any heat coming out of the, the, the interior of Mars to determine how geologically active or geologically dead Mars actually is. When it so. ties back to, again, the, the reference about Chris McKay, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that he's talked about quite a bit, in terms of sending probes down, not such a big issue. The moment we start going properly underground, that's pretty much when we've completely contaminated a planet or a mm. moon. Um, yeah. The moment you start building underground habitats or you send probes into subsea oceans, you are then, you need to make sure that you're at COSPAR 4B. Like, you need to make sure that that probe is completely decontaminated so you're not taking microbes from Earth there. Yeah, um, and that's going to be super important with Europa because we're going to have to drill through a lot of ice and... Even submarines on Titan and things like that. Like, yeah. there's all these different ideas that have been thrown around for years mm -hmm. uh, that people are working on. And, yeah, it's all about the sort of the COSPAR issues, the astrobiology aspects, and making sure it's not sort of forward contaminating. Yeah, we definitely don't want to do that. So well, not, yet. We, not yet. Not <laughs> yet. Well, I mean, like, first of all, if you want to, if you're trying to prove that there's life somewhere, you don't want to bring life from Earth with you. Say, I found life, and then, you know, it's, it's oh, very familiar. Oh, <laughs> Bob, did you I feel forget like I've to, seen this yeah, before? Yeah, yeah. Bob, did you forget to wipe that down? You know, kind of, kind they, of. Problem they had that on the there. space station. Like so. they forgot to wipe down a bunch of laptops, yeah. and everyone's freaking out, going, "We've found microbes on the outside of the space station," and it's because they didn't wipe down some laptops. Yeah, every, right. every it seems like every like eighteen to twenty four months, a microbes on the space station. Where did this come from? Story appears on a bunch of science websites. And then all of a sudden, within like 48 hours, it's like, oh yeah, they're they're from inside. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next uh, up. And next one, um, I own Thrister 33T. I yeah. own this street. I own the street. I own this street. There you Great. go. Thank you for everyone helping. Uh, <laughs> that you, was a team effort to, it, to get there. It really was. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. just, it's a Ron Burgundy issue. Uh, you touched on the XMR's rover a little in this episode. Any chance we can get a space pod on it? That'd be pretty cool yeah. to do that. So, like mis a mission-specific space pod. So, yeah. yeah. It'd be an evergreen space pod. Yeah. It'd be pretty cool. Yeah, it'd be pretty, pretty neat. How neat is that? It's pretty it's neat. Pretty neat. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Your wish is as we command. Uh, mm -hmm. Last co comment comes from Ponder Lust, saying, I love this episode. McKay talks about stuff I think about often. I like that you've expanded your cast. Keep on epically, epic, epic. 
Epicking epically. Woo! Wow. That was really difficult That's to the say. new slogan for the show. That's no, it's not. Yeah. Because yeah. none of us can say it. <laughs> so no, keep on just... epicking epically. Yeah. Um, you know, I I appreciate your comment on the expanded cast. Uh, we. So does Josh. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, also, apparently, you're hard to understand. Yeah, people had some comments on the space pod. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm Australian. <laughs> it's not gonna change. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think you were fine. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. Can, if you can't understand Josh, you can slow down your YouTube video. It'll be fine. I'm sure <laughs> YouTube can do like the transcription thing as well. It well, understands what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. To be fair, I never understood what Ben saying it either, so it's okay. Oh, that's true too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all right, so that pretty much does it for this show. Uh, I want to make sure I also give a thank you to our ground support citizens. These people have given us ten, uh, $1 or more on Patreon and $1 a month on makersupport.com. They, of course, get their name in the show. Access to exclusive citizen-only hangouts. Again, we had one this last week, so if you would like to become a citizen and like to know what it was that we talked about, feel free to do that. Early access to After Dark as soon as it's available on demand. Oh, my goodness. What more could you possibly ask for? How about next week? We've got Patty Newman talking about the Newman Drive. That's going to be an ion engine that uses solid metal fuel. Yes, I'm you excited heard for smokes. that right. Oh, yeah. That's going to be in. in. No, not smokes. It's, it's metal. metal. It's solid it metal. Yeah. And metal. Ion, Fully yeah. cuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, Patty's it's, it's, an awesome dude. That will be an amazing interview. Nice. So, yeah. yeah, we're so. excited. All right, that is our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching A Short After Dark, followed by Tomorrow Science, <gasps> up next.